And then Adele says to Jane, don't you wish you were beautiful, Miss Anne? <laughs> I just wrote down like LOL roasted. Oh and my then god. They have this whole conversation around a flower and all this stuff. And then Jane gets Adele back by saying we shouldn't bother signing it, referring to her art, until we're a little bit better. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Lillian, hello, good morning, happy sunny day to you. The sun came out at last here. Oh I'm, my gosh. I'm vibing with it. How are you feeling? I'm thrilled. I actually have some time later this afternoon. I'm going to do some yard work stuff. I'm super excited about it. It's so gorgeous here in oh Minnesota today. So we're not only bringing you guys Friday energy today, we're bringing you sunny springtime, oh summertime, gosh. sunny Friday energy. <laughs> With energy that is typically not very characteristic to Jane Eyre. Although I don't know if you noticed in this version, uh, it, they had quite a few sunny scenes, especially mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting not to jump, not to put the cart before the horse, but like Jane's return to Thornfield, so sunny and nice. And I was oh. like, oh, that's so pretty. <laughs> oh, it is so nice. I, I agree. I think this is a much sunnier version. So it's, it's appropriate <laughs> that it's on a sunny day. Exactly. So to, in case you're unaware of, from the title of this episode, uh, this adaptation that we just watched was the 1970 movie, which actually is a made for TV film. I didn't realize until I was looking on the IMDb. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's what we watched. Um, I have to First, um, amend something that I said at the end of the last two episodes, where when I was preparing you for this, Lillian, because I had watched this one before, mm -hmm. I said that this was a very angry man who's easy to hate. I don't know what I was smoking this second time around. I was like, no, he's nice. I like him. So I, I don't know what that was about. Maybe I was still like riding my Timmy D or die, uh, <laughs> thing. And it, cause he wasn't Timothy Dalton. I hated him. I don't know, but I really liked this actually. Okay. I'm excited to talk about it. I did it like knowing that it's so funny how like the handful of little things that we hear from our listeners or you mentioned can just make me like look for specific things in specific moments when we're watching different adaptions. So I was like watching for him to be particularly angry. And I don't know <laughs> if it was because you said that, that I was like, Oh no, like, like a couple of times he's pretty angry, but mostly he's just a sweet bean and I like him a lot. Yeah. That's, that was my assessment too. So before we get too far into our thoughts and our notes and everything, Lillian, I think you're up for our wonderful uh, recap. So yeah, oh, I, I should was, get the timer ready. Yeah, you get the timer ready. I was just saying to Piper right before we started this, I was like, it's been so long since I recapped Jane Eyre because <laughs> we had our guests recap it and then Piper did it. And then we had a week last week, obviously we didn't recap for our fan cast. And so it's been almost a month since I've recapped Jane Eyre. Oh my and gosh. And how will, do I even know the plot anymore? You know, it's really <laughs> hard to say. So buckle up <laughs> listeners. If this is, if this is your first foray into Jane Eyre, listening to me recap it, recap the 1970s made for TV movie. <laughs> Ooh, what a fun journey you're on. What a very special treat. I, my, <laughs> my finger is over the start button. So whenever you start talking, I will start timing you. Okay. So we start with Jane being dropped off at Lowood school and the, don't worry, the carriage has been paid for. And then a very, very sad childhood comes in where we watch a little girl cough to death while teachers hate her. And then Jane goes, you know what? I don't want to work here despite your job offer, sir. I'm going to go work for this other person. And we watch her take a carriage to a really cool castle. And at that really cool castle, she meets the tiniest little French girl there ever, ever was. And then when she's got a governess there, a man tries to ride her down on a horse. And he's pretty upset about the fact that she was there at all. And then they fall in love and it's pretty great stuff. They do some smooches and he says he's never going to give her up. And then they go to get married and it turns out, oh my my God, he has a wife locked in the attic. What a twist. Shocked beyond all measure. She goes <laughs> off and becomes a teacher for some sad little poor children. Well, a man tells her over and over again that God wants her to 
be with him in India. And she goes, <laughs> no, thank you. And then she goes back to the sunniest day of all time. Well, where the least injured man ever to be in a fire uh, says that he still loves her too. And they end up together and happy. And we've got to assume they get married, but they don't actually say that. Mm, and one minute, 21 seconds. Dang, I, we, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> figure out a way to make them shorter. You know what? We're, we're kind of leaning back up. It's, it's a roller coaster, right? You know, we're going to make them longer. And then the next few ones, we're going to be like, there's a woman named Jane. She falls in love. Whoops. Woman in the attic. The end. Like it'll, it'll just, Perfect. it'll all change, you know? That's great. Yeah. yeah. I also felt like I wanted to call out some specifically special, special things for this one. Yeah. No, uh, you touched on some stuff that I am very excited to discuss. Uh, but with that, is there any initial things that you want to share? Uh, the, my first thing is, and I don't know if it was that my expectations were low or if it's that I haven't watched a really solid Jane Eyre adaption in a while, but I loved this one. I thought it was so good. I if you haven't too. watched the 70s, the 1970s TV version, it is so very worth watching. I mm -hmm. really, really liked it. I am in the exact same boat, Lillian. I stayed up last night. I was really tired and I wanted to go to bed, but I was like, no, I have to watch what I remember being a very bad version of Jane Eyre. <laughs> and I like put it on and I was taking all these notes and I'm like, there's so many good lines in this. I really mm -hmm. like his approach to Rochester is very, very compelling. And I'm going to dive into that later on, especially around the scenes where we talk about uh, Bertha and then him explaining to Jane oh afterward. God. Wow. Yes, do we want to do yes, that first yes. or should we, should we talk about childhood? I want to, I want to talk about childhood. I don't want to talk about it too much because they, what the two big things that I wanted to say about her childhood are one, she's like 14. She's yes. not like, they don't make her a little, little kid, which is good because they condense the childhood kind of skipping over, just referencing her mm -hmm. time with the reads. Um, and instead having her right at Lowood school. And it felt like they doubled down on how nightmarish that place was to kind of make it instead of having her like crappy aunt. So it's like, instead of having her crappy family, they went, what if this was just so horrible that everything made you want to cry? Right? No, the note that I made about that Lillian, because some of the details here that I think this version did that other versions didn't, where other versions, you know, she's, uh, she's shamed publicly, and the conditions are poor. This one, there's literally physical abuse, like at least towards Helen. So like she, this one woman, for whatever reason, has a target on Helen's back. She's just decided she hates this coughing orphan. And like, yes. there's this scene. yeah, like Helen is like washing up in the morning and the lady's like, you sinful, dirty child, you didn't scrub your neck. And she grabs her by the scruff, like forces her down to the wash basin and scrubs the shit out of the back of her neck, which would totally like bleed and bruise. And yeah. they do all kinds of horrible stuff. That lady then also punishes Helen and Jane. They both get the, the stool treatment, but Helen is forced to stand outside in the rain, coughing her lungs out. It's absolutely bonkers. And I, I agree with you, Lillian. I wrote down here. I'm like, this is an origin story for a villain. Like if you took, <laughs> I, I personally did not like the movie Corella. I thought it was dumb and bad, but if you took Corella de Vil, a woman who kills puppies and makes them into coats and gave her this visual backstory. It'd be like, I get it. I understand. The world is cruel to you and you can do whatever you want. And Helen just like, oh, first, I, what I, a couple of things that I did really like about how they did this is I liked that they had Helen and Jane be a team. Like, I really yes. liked that when Helen gets punished and like, again, that teacher who just like had it out for her sends her out in the hallway. All the girls are like pushing into a room, I think for like lunch or something. I think um, they've come from their long walk where it's cold yeah. and they're all clamoring around the fire to get warm. Yeah. And then Helen gets sent out into the hallway because she's the one who's like being a problem, even though she's doing the exact same thing that everybody else does, but Helen's coughing, which makes her a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so they send her out into the hall and Jane just chooses to go out in the hall with her, which I think that is, that I think is one of those lovely Jane Eyre characteristics where I'm not sure that that particular moment is in the book, but it's such a great example of the kind of strength that I find really compelling in Jane Eyre. Yeah. Is that like, it is rebellious. It is stubborn. It is passionate and all those things she gets accused of. But in this very specific way where it's still respectful, it's still like it's it's not 
it's a rebellion, but not in a, I'm just going to stand here with my hands on my hips and yell at you kind of way that right. is very easy, not easy, but like, it's easy to confuse with mm-hmm. the kind of strength that Jane has. And so I liked that. I liked that Helen then backed up Jane when Jane was in the same situation, but it was rough then when she yes. died, it doubled <sighs> down how heartbreaking it was that they have all of these lines. So they have, we don't actually watch Helen die, but she goes into the bed the same way that she always does. And we know Helen's going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> Jane crawls into the bed with her and she's saying, uh, Helen's going to, instead of them knowing that Helen's dying that night, Helen's talking about how she's going to go home to see her guardians. And then she's going to come back. And then it's, we shall live together forever. And she describes this whole life they're going to have. And then we cut to 10 years later at her grave. I know, I know that scene hits so hard. And the lines that they wrote, I don't know if that was taken from the book or if this was made original for this version, but yes, I totally agree. The lines that Helen and Jane say to one another when they're lying there in bed, if she's like, don't leave me, stay with me. We're going to, I'm going to come back. She's like, I'm going away now, but I'm coming back again. These, and the fact that you're right, that we know that she's on death's door. There was, because they're so young too, the note that I made here is, there's a depth of sorrow to this scene because they are children who are forced mm-hmm. to go through this experience where mm-hmm. if these two adults were doing it, it's like, well, of course it's still sad. But like the fact that this, the movie I think is establishing their like, look at the hardships she's already been put through and she's forced to grow up and forced to, you know, accept these hard truths very early on in life. Um, and I thought that was very powerful. So I totally agree with that. There was a line that I wrote down. So it's interesting too, a change that they made here is, so the famous, uh, famous scene, the scene where um, Brocklehurst cuts off a girl's curls. Mm -hmm. Typically that's not Jane that gets her hair cut. Uh, But in this one, they made Jane the one with the curly hair. And he says this line, he, so he grabs her, shears off her hair as she's crying, like, please don't cut my hair. And he then throws the curls at this woman and says take these relics of satan (laughs) just like oh my god there was a ton of lines that i laughed really hard at that are absolutely not supposed to be funny like there are things (laughs) that are supposed to be funny there were things that i thought were hilarious that i don't think were supposed to be funny and that was one of them like i was like mr broccoli what are you doing here man god that was so much (laughs) A quick note, too, when I was looking at uh, IMDb, so the made-for-TV version of this that was made for, uh, originally in America, uh, is shorter than the version of this that they did, that they released in the UK. Huh. Um, so where the the UK version was actually played in cinemas, and it apparently did include scenes of Aunt Reed and stuff like that. Oh. But I kind of liked this better of... Like, we don't need that. I thought it was powerful enough of her lying in bed, talking to Helen. And she's Mm -hmm. like, I hate the people here almost as much as I hate my aunt Reed. And she's like, who's aunt Reed? And she's like, don't worry about it. And like rolls over. And I'm like, (laughs) Ooh, who's aunt Reed? What could she have possibly done that Jane hates her more than this horrible place? So it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it makes sense to me to cut that. If you're also going to cut her going back to aunt Reed, like if you're not going to show that space and like how awful it was. If you're not going to show Jane going back and Jane as an adult who was abused as a child in that house, coming Mm -hmm. back and being like, I hold no grudges against you in my heart. And I'm happy to let this go. And this woman on her deathbed is still like, no, you are a little (laughs) kid and I will always hate you. You were designed for my suffering. Like if you're not going to include that second bookend, go ahead and cut out the first part. Like, cause that's just an example of how much better than everybody else Jane is right Um, yeah (laughs) childhood aside uh I I like the the time jump we then yes we just simply have her like turning down Brocklehurst and being like I got a job and she gets in the carriage and heads over I agree with you in your your recap assessment that Adele is uh petite and adorable I tried so hard to find how old that actress was. She Mm -hmm. was only ever a child actress. She was only ever in things in like the late sixties, early seventies. I could not find her birth year. So I could not figure out how old she was in this, but she looked so much younger than most of the Adele's. I -hmm. would guess she was like six or seven. Yeah. Very small and cute. Also for being so young, her accent 
her French accent and her French was very good. So I wondered if she was actually maybe uh, like bilingual, but I don't know. Yeah, that would be yeah. cute. That would be cute. We're just going to, that's my headcanon now about this actual human on earth. Aw, cute. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jane promptly um, is run over by uh, uh, Mr. Rochester, who she does not know yet. And I felt that scene was rather brief. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of potential for uh, intense initial feelings um, in that moment. And they did that scene rather quickly. But then they kind of made up for it, I feel, by having sort of the two of them assessing and, and feeling one another out in the scene that followed immediately after, you know, where she comes yeah. home, she sees pilot. He's sitting there boldly by the fire, which I really liked the lighting in this. Oh I thought, yeah. I have a couple of their notes on the lighting. Yeah. I did want to say one thing about that scene with the horse mm -hmm. is yes, they did make it a lot shorter and they also changed a pretty critical detail yeah. of that. One of those things that we talk about in period dramas a lot is like this forced proximity of like, they end up like the woman falls down and sprains her ankle. So he has to carry her. And like, it's the reverse <laughs> of that, right. In this scene where we always see like, he can't get to the horse, but the horse is too crazy for Jane to handle. This Jane is like, I actually think I can get the horse just fine. So she <laughs> does actually get the horse and doesn't help. She helps the horse to Rochester, not Rochester to the horse, which is mm -hmm. a pretty different way to play that scene. Yeah. Though oh. we do get a little bit of physical intimacy when she kind of like helps him get into the mm -hmm. saddle, but it's, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily like the kind of stuff that you would swoon over. So I think a lot of that, um, tension arrives from just the intensity of this guy illuminated by the fireplace, uh, mm -hmm. and then speaking to her in such a way. I want to talk about the fireplace scene and I don't want to derail you again, but my favorite moment in this movie happens when Jane comes home from getting like finding out that Rochester is actually like Mr. Rochester. And we always get that line where, uh, Miss Fairfax is explaining that something happened to the master and he got hurt. And then like we watch Jane's face as she realizes that she met Mr. Rochester and that's what that was. And we see that put together. Miss Fairfax in this specifically says, some fool seems to have frightened his horse and made him fall. And <laughs> listeners, I will put this on our Instagram, but Piper, I'm going to share this with you now. <laughs> that's her face when she says it. <laughs> So oh my insane. god <laughs> her face is like oh fuck that's, <laughs> that's amazing um okay let's talk real quick since we're like looking at her um just about the visuals of uh this casting choice so she again i think she's pretty i don't think she's not uh unattractive mm -hmm. but she doesn't look uh young to me i mean not in the do like you... teenage 18 year old way she seems how old like do you think she is because i looked up how old she is and she is by far our oldest Jane. Oh, I was going to guess, mm, I was going to guess late twenties, but you saying that makes me think she's in her thirties. She's 31. Okay. Wow. I wonder why yeah. they chose maybe just cause they liked her acting and they're like, she's the right for it. Who cares about her age? But she was in a ton of movies at the time. So she may have had a level of, um, I don't think she, it, she was in a bunch of UK things. Okay. So that could have been what that was, but He's, he's quite a bit older than most Rochester's as well, but not mm -hmm. far outside of the scope of that. He's 43 yeah. Yeah. or she's 31, but okay. I think that totally changes the dynamic. And mm -hmm. I, if there's moments when he calls her a young lady or a girl or whatever, and I'm just <laughs> like, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, I, okay. So talking of him, um, in my memory, I was like, I, again, I don't know why I was so anti this film the first time I watched it, but in my memory, I was like, ah, he's like a weird crotchety old man. And he's so grumpy and blah, blah, blah. And again, I was probably because I was like holding him up next to a Timothy Dalton. And I was like, look at you, you toad. <laughs> so like, but upon rewatch, um, so George C. Scott, I know him from Dr. Strangelove, uh, which is a fabulous movie. Uh, I really liked his Visually, I really liked him visually as Rochester. He had mm -hmm. this very strong, stern face, and yet it wasn't ever scary. I know he felt he looked like a cowboy because he is an American actor. So this might be our first. No, I guess the '30s movie was probably American the, made. Well, and um, wasn't the '96? Yes, yes. Um, the one with what's his face, William Hurt. Uh, he was. Yes, he was American, but when I when I said first American actor, I meant like uh, chronologically oh, in chronologically. time. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, but either way, I thought he did a good job. I liked his voice, and I thought he was rather handsome. But I didn't think he would find him handsome. But I don't know. Yeah, I think he 
he had one of those looks where I think, so I, because I had a weird, one of those cool dads who was really into war movies and decided that that should be a family <laughs> hobby. Um, the movie that I know him from is Patton. That is a, don't watch it. I mean, like, unless you want to watch a war movie, that's like super classic. I don't remember almost anything about it, but I do like vaguely just have this memory of him being like pretty intense, mm-hmm. which is fine for a Rochester, but that's, that's kind of the, the vibe that I got from him was like intense, but not necessarily, I wouldn't, if, if he was in a lineup of Rochester's, I wouldn't call him handsome. Right. Like I don't think that I would call him out as handsome, Mm -hmm. but I am very attracted to the way that he played Rochester. I think that what we talked about, it's hard. It's always, it's one of those things where it's always coloring how I feel about Rochester's with Mm -hmm. the last one that we watched. Like we, it's hard to watch them outside to see them outside of the context that we have here. But when you compare him to like everything I hated about the 34 guy, where he was just like nothing and he had no personality and no passion and no anything like compared to that, the intensity that Mm -hmm. this man, that this man played this character with was very attractive to me. I thought that was really, really well done. And it made me like him a lot. I agree. I definitely think that George S. Scott really brought his talent to this role. Uh, and it, I would compare his pensiveness to the delivery of the lines to what I love about Timothy Dalton's performance, because I think Timothy Dalton, he had that same pensiveness, but he added a lot more kind of in my opinion, smoldering melodrama. This guy kind of cut out the um, soap opera-ness and just did the, this is a man who is trying his best and suffering greatly and hopes for something better. And I really loved how that came through. And he has that, those subtle moments, right? Where like, there's, there's moments in his acting, particularly having that lens on that we talked about where like, I was going into this ready for like a Syrian Hines level of angry. Um, (laughs) And I was watching him and the only moment, there was one moment that I was like, I see where this anger crosses a line from Mm -hmm. like passionate but controlled Mm -hmm. and what it really came down to. And I, and it was sort of an insight into where I feel the line should be for a Rochester. Cause I think we've talked about the idea that Syrian Hines has moments where he's far too angry. We've talked about, um, how the 57 Patrick, what's his nuts was too, (laughs) like too angry and, and bad time. Um, (laughs) and I think what it comes down to is those moments where you feel it's an unsafe level of anger, right? Like, yes. Is he a passionate person Mm -hmm. who is, has a, he can go up to a 10 in his, in his feelings, but he's, he's really got that under control. And I'm not, I'm never worried he's going to hurt someone or anything like that. There's one moment in this where he loses control in a way that feels unsafe for a moment. And that's Mm -hmm. when he knocks the stuff off the table. Yes. And she sits there statue still. Mm-hmm. He very quickly backtracks from that and kind of yeah. realizes that that was probably not an okay thing to do. But that's the only moment for me that crossed that line from Agreed. passion yeah. to like an unsafe anger. And let's, yeah, let's talk about like why he kind of explodes in that moment. Cause so this is him, uh, you know, discussing with Jane in the version that I had on YouTube, it seemed as if it skipped a scene. Okay. It did. Uh, this, I have a note on this. It, if you watch this version, mm-hmm. if you guys want to watch the seventies version, you can watch it with Amazon, but you have to watch it with commercials. Mm-hmm. Do it. It's worth it because I went, I watched the one on YouTube as well. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to see, I was like, oh, there's one on Amazon. Let me just go see how much we missed there mm-hmm. because I couldn't figure out if it was just like a few seconds or like 10 minutes. Yeah. It wasn't, we w- missed Adele getting a present. Like that's all we missed. Okay. Um, but they remastered it. So the quality is oh. like unbelievably better. Like nice. it's so, so much better and very worth the commercials. So awesome. that's my little side note for our listeners. Watch the one on Amazon. <laughs> Good to know. So yes. Yeah, so it's after he's given the present to Adele, he's dismissed Adele. And now he's sort of like assessing Jane's character. And when he freaks out, 
I, I tried to write this down. Um, he's talking about sins or something and he screams, have you none of your own? And mm-hmm. he smashes the things. And I think it's his frustration of here he is maybe wrestling with his morals, right? Because he knows that he has feelings for this girl. And I think he's trying to find a fault in her so he can say, no, she's not worth me committing bigamy and like being dishonest or cheating on my wife who I have upstairs. And the fact that she keeps answering every question perfectly, intelligently, ev- like evoking all these emotions from him. And so he's like, he's like, God damn it, I'm trying to resist you and I can't. And so it's interesting, right? It does cross the line into violence, but it's very interesting to see why he's that upset. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's just, it's it's really not a moment for me where I would say this because it's so early in the movie. And again, because I came in with those expectations, mm-hmm. it's very similar to how was, I've talked about how Syrian Hines is one of my favorite Rochester's right up until <laughs> he defends his actions when he tried to convince Jane to do a bigamy with him. And like, yeets her suitcase off the landing. <laughs> and yells at her that she's never going to be happy and she's making the biggest mistake of her life while she's in a carriage. And I'm like, could you for a second have a little bit of empathy where, so I was prepared for this man to like, I was like, okay, you seem fine. You seem fine. I'm waiting for something to happen. And then that happens. And I'm like, okay, buckle up. Cause this is just a peek inside the angry man. And then the <laughs> next day he's just like the sweetest bean and the rest of the movie. I'm just like, no, I think I love him. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. I, I can, completely agree. I love, so after the, the bed scene, um, when she saves him from the flaming bed, I don't have much to say about that scene apart from, I love whenever we see this in an adaptation where the next day she dresses kind of pretty because now she's got feelings for him and she's like, Ooh, I'm going to go see Mr. Rochester soon to be disappointed and take off her pretty dress and be like, yeah. I'm going to draw a portrait of myself to prove how ugly I am. <laughs> this Aww. is like, Poor Jane. Poor Jane. Um, The one thing that I want to talk about with the flaming bed scene, you mentioned the lighting, that they do really interesting things with the lighting in general in this adaption. Mm -hmm. I think the the way that they do it, they very clearly are thoughtful about where would the light be coming from. So I think that's one of the things that we see in the scene you mentioned with the fireplace, the, with the flaming bed scene, it's one of the things I think about a lot is in many of the adaptions, even when they're trying to have a level of authenticity with the lighting, they'll have like really big windows where they're trying to claim the moonlight is coming in and that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. This one, they did a very interesting thing with a candle and a spotlight. I noticed that too. Um, So they had who, whichever character was holding the spot, the candle had the spotlight on them. And that was the main source of light in this. The rest of the room was very dark. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's probably some additional movie film things that we would do slightly differently for that now. But I Mm -hmm. thought it was a really interesting way to address the problem of we need to be able to see these people, but it would be dark there. Mm -hmm. So how would they, how would they handle that? And I thought that was very interesting. Well, Lillian, if we want to also apply a sort of narrative analysis to that too, I think it also creates a great way of forming visual intimacy between them, right? So here they are, the two only things caught in the illumination of this candle, and we can see how close they are together in order to share that light. And it kind of there creates that that closeness and that intimacy in an otherwise dark and empty room. So yeah. yeah. Ooh, Sometimes I forget that you were a film minor in college and then you say <laughs> stuff like that. And I'm like, Oh, my co-host has these film criticism chops. So <laughs> this, this podcast gives me that outlet and it makes me so happy. <laughs> it's always fun to see that different sides of your friends like that. And I love it so much. <laughs> I okay so I want to get through a couple of notes real fast so we can talk about these important scenes that made Mm -hmm. this movie great Um, I just I love that when the party's happening and there's a scene where everyone's dancing down below I liked the comment that one old man made when they look up they see Adele and they're like the lady's like oh that's his ward and he's like that's what he wants everyone to think like I like someone else calling out that it's like well everyone knows it's probably an illegitimate child of his like that it's no secret I particularly enjoyed that in an adaption where we explicitly know, Mm -hmm. like he explicitly says that Adele is not his child, which makes it so much more interesting that he allows society to think that right? because it adds this layer of like how much he doesn't care about society's rules. He cares about what he feels is right. So Mm -hmm. he never corrects anyone when they, he tells them she's his ward. 
He yeah. tells them that he picked her up in Paris. Like he tells them just the bare minimum of facts. And of course, that's the conclusion that you're going to draw that mm-hmm. it's actually his illegitimate child, but he doesn't bother correcting anybody on that and doesn't really care what they think, which I think is so interesting. Yeah. I like that. I like that a whole lot. Um, one detail too in this, uh, and we're going to go into this later on, but I firmly believe this Rochester is not trying to gaslight Jane, but I think he is trying to like get her a little jealous so she can like kind of open up to him. But so because he's not like super duper pretending like, Oh, I'm going to marry Blanche. There's a scene where he's dancing with Blanche and she sees uh, Jane or they're talking about Adele and he's like, Oh yeah, my governess took Jane to bed. And she says, Oh, she's like uh, a weird little thing. And he's like, no, I think she's pretty. Like that's, I love that Rochester says that to Blanche. He's like, what? no, my governess is super pretty. You don't think she's pretty? And I just like, I'm like, all that, like that honesty is really nice. I liked that. I also really enjoyed that Blanche goes, I was talking about the governess and he goes, totally, like totally. I was talking about Adele. I wasn't talking about how hot I think my governess is. <laughs> yes. Don't even, don't question it. Just like, again, letting her ride with her assumptions. A moment that I have, right, that's right before these party scenes, it's uh, right when Rochester has left after the fire and we see Jane sad sitting by a rainy window. And then my favorite interaction between a Jane and an Adele happens because they roast each other. And I wrote down these exact lines. (laughs) So Adele is talking about how pretty Blanche is and like all this stuff about how well, I wonder if she's going to try to keep Mr. Rochester because I've heard she's really pretty. And then Adele says to Jane, don't you wish you were beautiful, Miss Anne? <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote down like, LOL, roasted. Oh and my God. They have this whole conversation around a flower and all this stuff. And <laughs> then Jane gets Adele back by saying, we shouldn't bother signing it, referring to her art. Until we're a little bit better. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes. It's equality. It's great. <laughs> it was so good. Just like these, like really as, as a Midwesterner in my bones, <laughs> I appreciate a good passive aggressive comment. And they both nailed it. Oh, it's so good. I wrote that down too. And I'm so glad you mentioned it. <laughs> Oh, okay. So one thing here, so here's some, some great lead up, right? When I talked about um, him not, not gaslighting Jane, because he did my favorite thing, which is where, you know, afterwards, after he's taking care of Mason, he comes back, they go for that little walk. Right. And then he's talking mm-hmm. with her and he's asking her about, you know, uh, your future home and all this stuff. Cause in this version, it's not him like lying to her, deceiving her. He's planning to propose to her and wants to know her genuine opinion. And it's Jane who, puts the idea forth that she's like, oh, you're talking about someone else. And again, like you said, he just kind of lets people, you know, believe what they want to believe until he corrects them in the Mm -hmm. end. Yes. So like he does the classic thing, right? Where, you know, he's talking to her honestly and asking her like about the house, like, would you want to stay here? Would you want to travel? And I loved that where in other versions that is done more so where he's doing the gaslighting and he's like, oh, I'm going to send you away to Ireland. What do you think about that? I'm going to marry Jane. But here, no, it's literally him thinking, I think just allowed to himself. He's maybe just voicing his thoughts where he's like, I wonder when we marry, will we stay here or will we go someplace else? But she doesn't realize that she's part of that kind of vision yet. So I I liked that. Yeah. And I also think he did the thing that I has potentially happened in other adoptions, but I always associate with the Syrian Hines where he's talking to her and he asks her in the same way that he's sort of alluded to this, I've made a mistake in my past situation. He asks her, he starts with advise me, Jane. And then he, he describes what we know is the situation where he got sent off and ended up marrying, um, uh, oh my God, Bertha, Bertha, there we go. (laughs) Um, ended up marrying Bertha and he's, he's talking about that situation. And he says what I think is such a great line, which is, I don't say crime. I say error when he's talking about the things that he did wrong. He says a capital error. Mm -hmm. And he explicitly calls out that it was this mistake that he made, which is essentially like he's, he's asking in so many words, if I made a mistake in my youth, should I be held accountable for those? If they were something like getting married, where it's this really permanent thing. And what I love about what she says back is she doesn't let him off the hook. And she says, we are each responsible to God for our actions, and we cannot ask others to take on that responsibility. And she explicitly thinks she's saying that about Blanche at the time. And to your point, he doesn't 
he, he, she says it. And instead of letting her think that and like go off for a couple of days and think that he's marrying Blanche, mm-hmm. he immediately goes, Oh no, hun, I met you. I'm yeah. definitely going to marry you, which I think is such an interesting thing, which comes back to the scenes we see later. But he is essentially in that moment asking her generically, how would she feel about this? Yeah. This crime that I've committed. And she explicitly says like, I don't think you can put that on someone else, which to me really justifies him not telling her yeah. because he's taking that burden of that, that mm-hmm. sin, sin mm-hmm. onto himself instead of putting that on her, which is what she explicitly says she wants. Yeah. Which he brings up in the scene afterwards, you know, when, after the reveal of Bertha and they're sitting there by the fire again, he says something. He's like, what, what was I supposed to tell you, Jane? If I told you the truth, you would hate me and you would leave, which sometimes uh, Rochester says that. And it sounds like a whiny excuse, but mm-hmm. here, no, I felt it. Cause yeah, it's like totally. that, that love. And he's like, I can't risk losing you. Like I, I can't risk you saying no to me. So yeah. Well, and it's, yeah, it's always, it's how that scene plays. We talk about that scene all the time, how the reveal of Bertha plays, how the, the moments after that, when he's talking to Jane, when he's trying to convince her to stay, how that plays, there's two ways that Rochester plays that moment. One is a man desperately in love who was backed into a corner and had no good options. Mm -hmm. And two is a man justifying his actions with a lot of anger and taking zero responsibility for the negative things that he has done to put other people into this situation. Exactly. I think he did it so well. He played that so well as someone who is just, he didn't have a good choice Mm -hmm. and he, yes, he did things that were considered objectively wrong, but he goes, what, what was I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. I love you. And I can't lose you. And if I told you the truth, you would have been burdened with this and you would have left me. Yes. And I chose to take this burden on myself. And he says a line specifically where he apologizes for hurting her Mm -hmm. and says he would never want to hurt her but he couldn't give her up. And that melted me. It was so good. Oh, I agree. I agree. I want to add um, some details here. We have to talk about a few things. So when he brings them up to Bertha, right? That scene, I think, is one of the best reveals we've ever seen because... Uh, he asks uh, Grace, Grace Poole, Poole. Yes, he asks her, how how are we today? And she's like, oh, a little iffy, but not too bad. Uh, Bertha then proceeds to attack him. And while others are grabbing Bertha to pull them off of Rochester, he's just holding her. Like, he's like, it's like, it's all right. Like, he kind of lets her, he, she takes him to the ground and he's not really fighting her back. And then when she has him there, she does this thing that's so equally creepy beautiful and sad where she has her hand kind of like a claw above his face but then she just doesn't hurt him she doesn't touch him and she just kind of like pulls the hand away and then he stands and he brushes the hair from his wife's face and he's very gentle with her and as he starts to describe what's going on and Jane disappears mid-speech which I thought was a little funny where he turns around she's just gone he has this incredible moment that I've never seen another version do where he then sits against the wall and looks at Bertha and he's like, how are you today, my wife? Will you tell me a tale of your day? Uh, will you let me place my head against your lap? And she's just sitting there kind of comatose. And it's this like sad acceptance of like, this is my life. If you were well, I would love to share these things with you or anybody, but I can't because you're, you're not there. I thought that yeah. was fabulous. It's the heartbreaking moment of, first of all, he talks about the reason why he hasn't left her or like abandoned her is like what I'm supposed to put her in an asylum do you have you that's the moment when Jane leaves is when he's saying have you been to an asylum like do you know what that is like they will she's her maybe thinking I grew up in one practically (laughs) I know right and then those moments when he's talking to her like he it's just that those that sympathy that we can and should have for Rochester like that that when you see this man trapped in this terrible situation He is so lonely and it breaks your heart watching him look at Bertha and knowing that he is the kind of man where even if he didn't love her, right? Like Mm -hmm. we know that he loves Jane in a way that he never would have loved Bertha, despite what he says one line (laughs) in this movie. But like, (laughs) we know that Rochester never loved Bertha. He was, he thought she was beautiful. He had this arranged situation where he kind of like out of naivete, what felt like felt like he was in love, but he didn't have that passion Mm -hmm. that Rochester so clearly desires and has with Jane. But 
he would have stuck it out with a woman that he didn't love. And he would have created a real relationship with her because Mm -hmm. he, but he's just so alone and so isolated. And it just like, I, there's only a couple adaptions where I've ever been like, don't Jane, don't leave. What do you mean? You're going to leave. But then even, so I don't want to, I don't want to go too far away from that, but then even Jane's justification later, this is one of my favorite Jane's as well. And I think even her conversation later and her explanation of why she can't be his mistress. Yes. Oh, so good. That, okay. Let's talk about that speech, right? Um, Because that was incredibly well done. It's obviously something that you would be drawn to. I know that about you. And also I loved it too. And I think it perfectly articulated the, uh, the conflict that Jane faces. Right. And what I wrote down here is when she's speaking of her rights and lack thereof, if she was his mistress, it is revealed that it's more important to her to have self-worth worth and respect and independence than it is to pursue true love. This thing that she's always like craved just to be loved by somebody. And I think that's so, I relate with that, you know, where it's like, I I want to be loved, but more so I want to be respected. And I want, like, she talks about that, like, level playing field and, you know, being equals. She has the line where she says, so they're going back and forth. And it's once again, one of those moments where she says, I can't be your mistress. And he kind of takes that moment of insecurity of going, well, oh, so it's just like Mr. Being Mrs. Rochester, you just want all my stuff. And she goes, no, that's obviously not it at all. And he responds with this idea of like, well, everything that I have is yours. And she goes, that's not what I want. All I want is you. And then she says back to him and it's so wonderful. And it's when I come to you, I come as an equal, I will be, I will not be less even for the man I love. Yeah. And it's that moment of like these two people who are both in these heartbreaking situations and Jane, who has worked her entire life to be someone who has to, who lives these values that she has. We see over and over and over again, again, Jane put in situations where her life would be easier and happier if she didn't stand with her values, Mm -hmm. but she does. And she lives them and she won't give that up even for the man that she loves. And it just rips your heart apart to watch these two people not be together. I know. And, and this is also the first time that I've seen this and it's incredible where, you know, they have that conversation. She goes and very gently, he says, he's asks her to stay. She's like, or not go or leave, uh, whatever the wording is. And she comes back and he sits down in the chair and she kneels beside him and rests her head on his knee. And he just says to her, he's like, he's like, just think about it. Just, just think about it for a little bit before you run off. And then, you know, it cuts, we see the fire is now extinguished. He wakes up and she's gone and he does like go into the house and kind of shout for her. But I think there's this kind of acceptance there that we don't typically see. And I also wrote down, this is the exact opposite of the Timothy Dalton scene where he's literally howling at her. He's like, you will be my bride. And this man is like, he's like, just please think about it before you abandon me forever and break my heart. And, and and he says, wait, wait just a while. Yeah. And she sits with him and you can see on his face that he can't let her go. And you can see on her face that she knows she's going to be the one to have to leave. And so the fact that she then left while he was asleep and I, while watching this, I, this is one of, like I said, this is one of my favorite Janes. I think she did such a fantastic job of playing all of this stuff. And there is a little bit, one of the things, the only real criticism I would have of this is she is no, they don't try to pretend that this girl, this woman is 18. Like they're Mm -hmm. not going like, this is a 19 year old girl. Who's just like wandering around the countryside. So because (laughs) of that, it makes it really hard to justify how she ends up lost in a field. Like I was watching this and I was like, why is she lost in a field guys? And I think they do such an amazing job of showing us that moment where her heart breaks and she has to stand up for herself and she has to be live those values that she has. And she gets in the carriage and she's riding away and she has this resolve. And the further away she gets, we watch that resolve crumble and her heart break. Yes. And she's standing out on the moors and the storm comes in. She's like walking and she trips. And it's it feels more real to me than when Jane literally crawls out a window. Like yes. it that the Jane crawling out a window feels like an, a 19 year old running away who doesn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. The 30 year old Jane getting in the carriage and driving away and watching her heart break and 
falling asleep on the moors and then they they pick her up they find her the um rivers find her Mm -hmm. and she's in their house and we hear them talking about her and she says nothing back to them and she's just sort of like dissociating like completely gone covered in dirt and then we see her in the bed and we watch her cry as she realized like as she thinks about where and it breaks your heart it is so well played. There's yes. no point where I'm like, Jane, you idiot. What the hell do you think <laughs> you're doing? Pull yourself together. Like, I just think they did that so well. And I didn't, I expected to find that ridiculous. I expected mm-hmm. to find her getting lost on the moors ridiculous because she was such a competent woman. Yeah. And they played it so well. I agree. I also, like what stood out to me too about that is when, after she falls and the the storm is raging around her, her hair has come undone and she looks rather wild. I thought there there were quite a few visual things that made it almost seem as if she was visually similar to how we see Bertha, you know, just like these women torn apart by their relationships with, you know, what happens when you get involved with Rochester, not that I'm saying it's his fault. It's just like, well, one woman was mad and is crazy. And one woman was heartbroken and lost. And it's Mm -hmm. just so interesting. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk just a scooch about the world's most boring man, Sinjin. (gasps) Sinjin Rivers. His sisters really tried to set them up. They really (laughs) feel like, oh, kiss Jane too. And I'm like, could you be a scooch more subtle? (laughs) They didn't say, they didn't explicitly say they were cousins, but we know they're cousins. Yep. They're practically dangling the um, uh, mistletoe over them on a stick and a string. And they're like, Ooh, but what if? Another, a note I have about Sinjin as well is like, he gives, he, he has a lot more passion in his speech about God than a lot of Sinjins do. Most Sinjins are sort of like, bland through and through even when they talk about god this guy's um, a god fanboy he is very into god um <laughs> he he says um when jane says no to him uh which she does hear Raj Hester on the wind and he is it's so that's an interesting way that it's played because he's Sinjin has like grabbed her to try to convince her that they should be together. And he's holding her and he says, Oh, Jane, Oh, Jane. And like, she has no reaction to that. And then she hears Rochester's voice on the wind saying literally the same thing. Yeah. And she like immediately is like, no, I've been loved. I know what being loved is and I have to go. Yes. And he says, um, you rejected God. And I wrote, LOL, no, she's rejecting you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she has this, uh, there's so many great Jane speeches in this movie that we haven't mm. seen in other ones. Like she has a line where she's like, she's like, you cannot love God alone. She's like, she talks mm-hmm. about, yeah. And what you said of like, I've been Ugh. loved. I know what it is to be loved. And I think there's a very interesting, um, you could read that scene in a couple different ways. Whereas before in other versions, you know, when she's not in his embrace, when she hears um, Rochester's voice, it, we have sort of that magical realism element of like, are they tethered with that string under the rib? Like he said, but here you could also read it more semi realistically of just as she's in this man's arms and he's like calling to her, she's reminded of the man who called to her before whose arms she actually wants to be in. And she's like, you know what? No, this is a really shitty replacement. I'm going to back, back to what's good. So thank you for showing me that by comparison, but yeah. And I thought it was just such a beautiful way. It does make me curious, um, as to how much of that speech was in the book, which I, I don't want to spoil things for our listeners, but you guys do know we purchased the book. (laughs) <laughs> we have we have now made a plan for how we're going to read it and share that with you guys. So that's more details coming soon on that. But it's making me really excited. <laughs> this adaptation in particular had a lot of moments where I was like, I want to know how that is in the book. I yeah. like really want to know how that plays in the book. So I'm 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 curious about that to see if those kind of lines were in the book because I do know that Jane's faith is something that we talk about in terms of like value a lot, mm-hmm. but is something very interesting. And that I think is a much bigger theme in the book where we see it in uh, represented in the movie, but we're not in Jane's head. So it's harder to hear Jane's logic about that yeah. in terms of her, her actual faith. Yeah. But that was a really interesting moment to me of someone kind of transitioning. Jane seems like the kind of person who isn't necessarily going to just believe what she's told to believe about faith. And mm-hmm. I think we see that a lot. And I think this moment was an interesting moment to see her realization that her relationship with God and the way that she experiences God has nothing to do 
with with the things that Sinjin is talking about and going out there and um, doing what I think is pretty shitty, which is showing up to other countries and be like, you should love Jesus. Um, <laughs> and instead saying, well, this is how I love and experience God is by loving people because yeah. God created these people and I love them. And it's mm-hmm. such a rejection of that idea that I think particularly at the time, although we do still see it now, um, that God is about like giving up the things of the world as opposed yeah. to God is the things of the world. Yeah. And I thought that was a really, really powerful statement and way that she handled that. I agree. No, I I love it. I I'm very excited. There's so much things we're going to uncover when we actually mm-hmm. read the novel that this it's is based so, on. <laughs> I, it's almost like, and I don't want to make any sort of bold claims, but it's almost like if you want to understand Jane Eyre, you should read, read the, the book. book. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to quick share. Um, it's I've always been a movie person. You mentioned earlier that I was a cinema minor um, in college. And so I. it's for me, I tend to see a movie first and then read a book. And I know that's kind of controversial. I know a lot of book lovers are would be like, sacrilege, you must read <laughs> the book and then see the movie. But I have always found personally, because you're always going to get more information in the book than you are from the film, right? So if I see a movie that I enjoy, it's then more enjoyable for me to go read the the source material because then I get to learn so much more. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go the opposite way, you only lose something. Like, at least when it comes to, like, uh, details and stuff. If you, you know, a movie is never going to have everything that you love about it that the book had. So mm-hmm. my approach, I get to enjoy both mediums. <laughs> yeah. And I think for something like, I, this was definitely the way I experienced Pride and Prejudice. And for um, more dense, like, something that you would actually consider literature. Mm-hmm. Um, things that I, similar to when I actually refer to something as, like, a film. I'm like, mm-hmm. no, it's like, there's levels to this. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> I read a, like a lot. I read like a lot of books, um, <laughs> but I generally read things that are a bit lighter. Um, and it was something like Jane Eyre where there's all of these like layers and nuances in reading the beginning. It feels very similar to me when I read Pride and Prejudice for the first time mm-hmm. where I knew the movie mm-hmm. at really well by the time that I read the book. And it was really important because I would not have been able to follow and appreciate all of the nuances of Mm -hmm. the book without knowing the story already. Mm -hmm. Uh, It feels very similar to me in reading the beginning of Jane Eyre, where I'm reading this and there's all these little nuggets in these childhood chapters that I'm like, oh my God, this is this because of this that happens. And then we're establishing this already. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I think I probably would not have, I not think, I know for sure. I would have not appreciated the book to that, to the level that I am now, Mm -hmm. had I not seen these movies first. I would honestly um, be really curious to know our listeners' thoughts on this approach and what your intro to Jane Eyre was. Did you see a movie or TV version first and then read the book? Or did you start with the book and then see the films? And then how did that change your experience? So I would love for you guys reach out, tell us uh, either airbuds at gmail uh, or um, at airbuds on all social. We'd love to hear your experience. Well, I've got a few more things. And then I think we're going to do ratings and wrap up and talk about what we're doing next. Absolutely. Um, We already talked about the sunshine and the gardens uh, that she comes back to when she returns to her man. Specifically want to talk about the fact that the guy who sees her at Thornfield when it's burned down Mm -hmm. and tells her about what happened explicitly says that a burning timber fell on Rochester (laughs) and he's blind now. So I'm buckled up. I'm ready to go to see someone who has been hit with a burning piece of timber after falling through the floor. He's hit to the face with it. She shows up and he is fine. (laughs) He's blind, but that's all. Well, okay. I thought it was really... I don't know, both cute and funny that this actor simply just had his eyes closed. Like they didn't like, you know, do a, a smoky eye, like a, a foggy eyeball. He just sits there with his eyes closed. And I'm like, well, that takes effort to like keep your eyes shut. Um, but I did notice there's a tiny little scar kind of like on okay. in the inner corner of his eye, but it's so small. Maybe if you but watch you the- a, um... You got a widow splinto now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
though he also did have more gray hairs when she came back to him so oh, this tells okay. us if we are you know being scientists that um mm. if a fiery beam hits your face <laughs> your hair turns a little bit gray but only in a uh, kind of handsome devilish way yeah and he didn't even grow a scraggle beard nope so i don't know what that's about did he not get the memo that if you're sad and um blind you have to grow a scraggle beard uh, but at least we we don't know if he got his sight back because they didn't tell us anything about what happens after that last sunny scene in the garden because they don't mm-hmm. need to because they were happy forever. Exactly. But that was that was really cute. The that whole scene was so cute. Mm-hmm. And big shout out to fan favorite pilot. Yes. What a great dog. First of all, this dog is in a lot of the scenes. What an yeah. amazing actor. Ten out of ten <laughs> for this pilot. And then he's so cute in that last scene it's just the cutest little pilot you've ever done seen he's a big boy he's a cutie patootie I oh, just I, died I was nodding my head yes and I was thinking you meant Rochester because I also thought he was really <laughs> cute like we didn't see the usual jealousy in him when she comes back and he's all like did you talk to men while you were gone <laughs> in this he was very much he's like oh you're probably married now I bet your husband's worried about where you are and she's like I'm not married and he's like oh like I guess no one proposed to you she's like I didn't say that and he's like oh um well you should be married because you're not very pretty so not a lot of those offers will come along but uh if you get married i'll i'll bring adele home from school so she can go to your wedding and i'm like that's so cute the idea that he would like not not only that that annoying jealousy is gone but he's like i support your marriage and i will bring home your past pupil because she would love to see you in a wedding dress and it's such a cute like it's not a rageful jealousy it's he's so clearly like jealous but in that way of we often see Rochester immediately reject her offer of being with him because he doesn't think he's worthy of her anymore. But we see Rochester reflecting that same feeling of I'm not worthy of you by instead saying like, I'm sure some amazing guy has snatched you up because you are a catch. Yeah. And then she teases him back in a very subtle, very cute way where she's like, um, I don't think you can reject other offers either because you're not so much of a catch anymore. Are you now? Just like, yeah, exactly. Somebody over here is blind. <laughs> Indestructible blind dum-dum. <laughs> You'll have to, unfortunately, we'll have to compromise and just marry each other. Oh boy. Two uggos getting married. <laughs> um, what final notes do you have for us, Lillian, before we give our scores? The last line that she says to him when they're sitting there together and she says, um, I've come home, Edward, to stay. That killed me. Mm, I also have so a nice. few little cast facts and then cast I have a bonnet facts. watch. Yeah. Um, so Susanna York is our Jane. Like I said, she's 31. She is in a ton of things. I did not recognize any of them, Uh but she has uh, 107 IMDb credits. Wow. Uh, George C. Scott, um, as I, as we mentioned, we know him from a couple of different things. He was 43 at the time and he has 89 IMDb credits. Nice. And then the actress who played Blanche also in a lot of things, she had 54 IMDb credits and her name was Neuer Don Porter. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like and then <laughs> Sam Jen is actually in a ton of things, mm-hmm. but um, he actually was probably in things that we've seen, but he was much older at the time. Hmm. Uh, so he was in, his name is Ian Bannon. And he was in Braveheart. I haven't actually seen that, but he played the leper in Braveheart. I don't know if that's a character people know. <laughs> Classic <laughs> character, the leper from Braveheart. <laughs> that was the only one I that I was like, well, people probably know this, but he has 109 IMDb credits. So he had the most IMDb credits of any of these cast members that I called out. Well done. Um, so <laughs> great solid solid bonnets in this really okay. good bonnets my notes all of the bonnets that we see in lowwood i just wrote down jiffy pop like they all look <laughs> like a jiffy pop thing that's full of popcorn yes <laughs> the, the thing that i noted is that the teachers are always wearing bonnets the children are only wearing these little straw bonnet hat situations when they go outside but mm-hmm. the teachers always have very intense bonnets and the same style of bonnet is what the um maids and things wear in Thornfield. So that's mm-hmm. what I have there. Um, Miss Fairfax always has a killer bonnet. 
This was a 10 out of 10 Mar- Mrs. Fairfax bonnet. So amazing. Um, Jane has her classic black bonnet. And then she also has sort of like a straw hat situation for when she's outside. Mm-hmm. Um, Blanche has a very beautiful flower crown at some point, which yeah. I will be posting. I loved that. I thought they've had Blanche have flowers in her hair before, but this was like very well done. I thought it really stood out to me. Um, her after the proposal bonnet, Jane mm-hmm. has a specific bonnet that she wears after her proposal and it is so good. Oh, it was I, so cute. It had I remember like this a standing lot out of, to me. it had a lot of very subtle details to it. It was mm-hmm. very, very Jane in that it seemed incredibly practical, but it was very post-engagement Jane in that it also seemed a little bit fancy. Cute. We should do at some point a whole character analysis based solely on Jane's bonnets. And because, okay. uh, we kind of talked about this in the 2011 one um, where I just love the idea that Jane's wardrobe reflects a lot about how she sees herself, right? Mm -hmm. Because when she thinks of herself as a plain governess who no one could love, she usually has a boring bonnet, if one at all, slash a plain black dress. But I love how like in this after, you know, she's, her heart starts to flutter for the guy that she works for. So she puts on a cute outfit. And once she, you know, gets wealth and stature and other versions, she buys herself fine clothes to match. And like now that she's like, oh, like I get to be with this man that I love where I'm engaged to him. I'm, I'm going to wear an outfit that shows the world how happy I am. And mm-hmm. I just love that. It's so good. Um, the last bonnet watch that I have is just that Adele And I believe the nanny and Mrs. Fairfax are the ones at the wedding and they are wearing top quality bonnets when we get their reaction to the, um, Adele is at the wedding and she looks very confused when it gets (laughs) interrupted. She's like, hold on, what? I prefer the, um, people in the church with them. Cause it's always like so sad and uncomfortable whenever Rochester and Jane comes barging out of the church and people start throwing rice. And he's like, you're 12 years too light. <laughs> like, I'm so angry. <laughs> it's like, Oh my God. I loved how here he like drags Jane to this carriage, puts her in the carriage, gets up and drives the carriage himself. <laughs> like he's not even going to wait for a driver. He's like, I need to show you this problem right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Um, (laughs) all right. Well, I am curious as to what your rating is, man. Okay. So I said 8.5, but this conversation, I now kind of want to give it a nine because I just think, yes, there were so many great conversations. Okay, good. Yeah. Mine was also, mine was also an eight. And then while we were talking, I was like, dang girl, it's a nine. It's a nine. Um, So mine's, mine's pilots. What's your, um, metric? Ooh, I'm going to give this one, uh, I'm going to do Timmy D's because that's okay. how I rank things that I, that I love and make my heart flutter. And this, and that that's regardless of whether or not it's Jane Eyre, when we're out eating food, yep. Piper is always like this restaurant is a six out of seven Timmy D's. And that's I'm like, true. what a weird scale. <laughs> but, <okay. laughs> Amazing. Yeah, no, it's true. It's how I live my life. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm glad that we both loved this. I I'm always hesitant until we see all of them to ever assign anything a 10. So I think at the very end of this podcast journey, we should decide which one of these deserves a 10 out of 10. Well, um, that, so we're, we're doing some, some conversations about future episodes and we will, this is our 10th adaption of Jane Eyre. Um, so we are going to, in the near future, have a whole conversation about kind of reflecting back on these first 10 that we've watched and all that stuff. But right now, Piper, I just like, I can't, I can't even taste those little subtle thing in your notes. (laughs) I can't, it's all kind of blending together. I can't taste, can't taste any of that, that good, good, subtle Jane Eyre, the, the little, the little things. Yeah. Yeah. If you're willing to do something about that. I agree. If there was only something that we could uh, consume, swish, and spit out uh, <laughs> to help us enjoy Jane better, <laughs> like so, so what? So we've got a palate cleanser coming out. Which, if you don't know that that's a thing that we do, what a weird conversation Piper and I just had. So um, every five episodes where we talk about Jane Eyre, we have a uh, next episode that is our palate cleanser where we watch something else, a different period drama um, adaption. So far, it's all been adaptions of books that were written around that same time that were adapted. Um, I have bullied Piper into doing it is a book adaption. 
<laughs> but it is significantly more recent. Um, <laughs> and so I bullied Piper into doing uh, Bridgerton. I Season tried. One. <laughs> I tried to bully her into watching both seasons. <laughs> she has <laughs> agreed to watch season one um, in the next week. I wanted to bully her into watching two seasons in a week, listeners. Um, that's how much I love this. Well, um, uh, Lillian, I don't think you you gently, very kindly asked me to watch a show after I forced you to consume seventy plus adaptations of a story you originally despised. So I don't think bully is the right word. Um, I'm happy to watch Bridgerton for you. Oh, good. Yes. I think you'll like it or I wouldn't have done this, but um... yeah, it'll probably be how like before this, I was like, oh, this is about an angry man. And I was so wrong. I started watching Bridgerton and the first few episodes didn't catch me, but maybe I was in the wrong headspace or maybe I wasn't paying attention. So I'm ready to go back and give it another viewing. Yeah. So next week we will be talking about Bridgerton season one. I will tr- be watching it again, even though I did rewatch it like three weeks ago, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I absolutely adore it. It is for sure. Exactly. My Jimma jam. So it's very good. I have <laughs> watched, I have read all of eight of the Bridgerton novels. And then I have also what read all eight of the spinoff ones and most Julia <laughs> Quinn books. So oh my gosh, I have a lot more source material knowledge for this, but it isn't <laughs> the, the, the TV show is very different from the books, but I do love it very, very, very much. Cool. And again, that was a case where you saw the show first and then consumed the, the books. So you got mm-hmm. more out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm, see, it works sure. people. Don't, don't uh, punch it till you try it. Yeah. We're going to, this is similar to previous statements where Piper is very interested in hearing your thoughts in a productive conversation. I'm going to fight you. (laughs) And with that, uh, if you want (laughs) to know how, uh, what time and what, um, came out parking lot to meet Lillian in for a fist fight, um, please send us your preferred address. Uh, you can reach us at earbuds at gmail.com or at earbuds on all major social platforms, though. Instagram is where we have the most fun. And you can also send us any suggested adaptions that you have for us to watch as well. We had some really fantastic adaption suggestions come in. We're so excited to watch the Jane Eyre musical. Oh. We had some spectacular listeners send us some links to where we can watch that. So we're going to be doing that soon. Um, and we've got a couple other adaptions coming up, but we always want to watch what you want to hear our thoughts mm-hmm. on. So please feel free to send us any, send us any adaptions that you think you'd want to see us watch. And ideally, if you have a way for us to watch it, great. If not, and you're just like, I just want to manifest this. Um, I've been doing a lot of internet digging and I'm, I'm trying to find, dig, dig for that gold. Cause there's some adaptions that are hard to find that I really want to see. So <laughs> we've got a bunch of good ones lined up, but please, please, please email us with what it is that you want us to see or comment it on any of our social. Yeah. And until then, maybe watch Bridgerton with us and join us next week for that assessment. But uh, otherwise, thank you guys so much for joining us and happy Jane Eyre reading and watching. Bye. Bye. Bye.